Um, so I want to start with an uh, overview of uh, Meta Data Center Fabric. Um, uh, the bottom layer of our data center is uh, rack switches. As we move up, we have fabric switches and spine switches, which are aggregated uh, through the fiber aggregator, aggregator layer with reaches up to three kilometer. And all of these interconnections are based on FR4 type optics. And um, as we move from one generation to the next, uh, we typically start uh, by upgrading the upper layers and move towards down, uh, which uh, makes the backward compatibility one of the main requirements of uh, our data center. The table on the left side shows different generations of our uh, DC fabric. Our current generation is based on uh, 25.60 switch uh, using 200 gig FR4 PMDs uh, with four lambda and uh, 50 gigabit per second PAM4 modulation. As we move to the next generation, we plan to use the 400 gig FR4 uh, in 51T switch, um, where the data rate is doubled compared to the previous generation. And we expect that as we move to 100T, the same approach of doubling the data rate is still feasible and we can go to 800 gig FR4 PMDs. Uh, but it's still unclear what we can use for 200T generation switch. And that's the main topic of uh, uh, this, uh, this presentation. So if I go to the next slide, um, doubling the baud rate is very challenging in this generation. Uh, due to the fact that the dispersion penalty is much higher and we need much higher bandwidth uh, optical components. And uh, the other options we have are using higher modulation formats and coherent detection or a combination of these different options, uh, but they have their own challenges in terms of cost and power efficiency. So we believe a more likely approach would be uh, moving from the CWDM4 uh, grid to CWDM8, where we reduce the channel spacing from 20 nanometer to 10 nanometer and uh, having 1.60 FR8 PMDs. One of the main considerations here is, of course, as I mentioned, is backward compatibility with the 800 FR4 generation. So there can be two uh, options for implementation of 1.60 FR8. Uh, the first one is based on a cooled uh, transceiver. This increases the complexity and power consumption and it might not be compatible for next generation or future generation integrated systems. Um, a more prefer preferred uh, approach would be an uncooled 1.60 uh, using a tracking demultiplexer where we try to uh, tune the receiver to the incoming TX channels. Uh, for this option, we need to introduce additional specs uh, for the wavelengths to ensure the backward compatibility, which I'm gonna uh, talk about later on. So a little bit more details on the uncooled 1.60 concept. Uh, as I said, uh, the idea is uh, for the receiver to track all the uh, wavelengths uh, channels coming from the TX side, which can move over temperature. And uh, there are two main considerations here um, for implementing the tunable demultiplexer. Uh, the first one is laser wavelength variation, uh, which has two components. One is the shift over wavelengths, um, uh, shift over temperature, which we can um, accommodate by tuning the demultiplexer. And the next component is targeting variation of the laser wavelengths due to manufacturing process. And this needs to be accommodated by design in the demultiplexer. Uh, the second point is the backward compatibility with 800 gig FR4. And uh, we need to make sure that the relative wavelength spacing between FR4 channels is in a way that uh, we can enable this backward compatibility. So moving to a few requirements uh, for this implementation. 
so typical demultiplexer designs that can be tuned are based on common mode tuning of all channels, which means we don't have uh, the capability to independently tune different channels. And uh, that's the main reason why the wavelength variation of the laser between different channels is important. Uh, on the right side, I'm showing uh, measurement data from our 200 gig FR4 modules. Um, so the x-axis is the maximum relative wavelength variation between uh, the four channels, considering all combinations. And you can see that all the 200 modules measured, uh, they can enable, uh, their variation is within minus plus two nanometer and 95, more than 95% of the channels actually uh, have less than minus plus 1.5 nanometer. This becomes important for feasibility of the DMAX because it sets a lower limit on the uh, demultiplexer passband. And uh, this curve shows the data from two suppliers at cold temperature and at uh, hot temperature. So the next set of requirements are uh, for the demultiplexer. Um, we have some targets here, which uh, are uh, relatively challenging to get, but we believe these are required to enable uh, cost efficient and uh, power efficient systems. The first parameter is the loss, which needs to be low enough to accommodate the uh, required link, bu link budget of integrated systems. And the next parameter is uh, the DMOX passband. It is, its lower limit is set by the laser wavelength variation, and the upper limit is set by the, uh, the fact that we are moving to a 10 nanometer spacing. The next important parameter is the crosstalk. On the right side, I'm showing a simulation of uh, receiver sensitivity penalty uh, versus total crosstalk. We believe better than 20 dB crosstalk is needed to, uh, reduce, to minimize the RF performance penalty. Power consumption is typically much lower than the other option, which is a cool transceiver. And we believe it's possible to get to 100 to 200 milliwatt and the tuning time of the DMAX should be in line with the requirements of the uh, bring up time for the transceivers. And of course, footprint is another important factor that needs to be considered in building these DMAXs. So the rest of the uh, talk, I'm gonna just uh, provide an example uh, DMAX implementation. Uh, Tunable DMAX, there are many technologies uh, that can be uh, used to implement them. Three of the main ones are shell grating, AWGs, and cascaded MZIs. Uh, there are different references here showing the implementations. Um, here I'm using cascaded MZI as they're offering low loss. They're pretty mature uh, components uh, that are used uh, for decades, uh, MAX senders, and they have a small footprint. So the proposed uh, demultiplexer design has two stages. Uh, we, uh, in this uh, design, we are separating the tunable uh, and passive uh, um, stages. And the main reason is to simplify the control. And the second reason is to be able to use the, reuse the, the developed passive demultiplexer in CWDM4. So the first stage is a deinterleaver that can be tuned and separates odd and even wavelengths. And the second stage is uh, based on a thermal passive demultiplexer, uh, CWDM4 demuxes for uh, odd and even channels. So more details on the deinterleaver part because we know that uh, the CWDM4 part is actually reused from previous generation. So my focus is gonna be more on the deinterleaver and its control. Um, the left side, you can see an example imp implementation of the cascaded MZI uh, deinterleaver with three stages. And each stage has one heater uh, with typical power of around 10 milliwatt per pi. And on the right side, I'm showing the uh, spectral response with passband of seven nanometer uh, and cross stack better than 20 dB in simulations. The other aspect of the design is uh, calibration and control. Um, so 
we are uh, considering two steps. The first step is calibration during, calibration during bring up. Um, for this, um, I have a m short movie here where we have at the top, state, top row, we have the interleaver response. Uh, the second row shows the odd and even CWDM4 DMAX, and the last row shows the output uh, channels. So as I play this movie, you can see we are tuning the the interleaver uh, to get to the optimum point of the demultiplexer operation. And by tuning, by uh, sweeping this, uh, the three heaters, we can actually get to the curve that's shown on the right side. And based on the maximum power transmission, we can find out what is the best operation point uh, for the DMAX. And in this case, it would be like this, where uh, the the interleaver even odd channels are tuned to the laser odd channels and even channels tuned to the even channels. So the next part of the control is active control over life. Uh, so you can see we have an additional circuit here where portion of the signal is separated and it, we feed a single stage max sender uh, filter which has a very steep response, so this facilitates the control. Uh, that's the first point. And the second point is it uh, separates the control uh, signal with the actual traffic data, uh, which means it's not going to impact, uh, the, the dittering on the heater is not going to impact the performance of the actual uh, signal. So as we do the calibration, the next step, we adjust this heater to minimize the power uh, that's coming out of this control stage. And once we find that minimum point, we try to keep this uh, heater uh, uh, in an in operation point where it minimizes the power over the lifetime of the transceiver. So in summary, um, uncooled and integrated uh, solutions enable, enable better scalability, scalability for future generations and applications in optics. Integrated tunable demultiplexer uh, facilitates implementation of an uncooled 1.6 DFR8. Uh, we have shown uh, measurements and simulations uh, that um, demonstrate uh, feasibility of the tunable DMAX, but we believe there are still challenges that needs to be addressed related to the process variation, uh, control, and reliability. Thank you.